Good morning. Buenos dias, bom dia, guten morgen. Can you hear me at the back? Fantastic. So, it's absolutely delightful to be here. Thank you very much to the Django Con people for inviting me. This is my first ever Django Con, which is a bit of a surprise to me because I've been using it since it was written, probably 10 years or more. Um, I'm absolutely knocked out by the fact they are doing live subtitling. I shall try to talk slow enough that they can understand what I say. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I do tend to talk very fast, as you will find out when you meet me in person later. Um, I'm going to have to try to talk, talk slowly. Anyway, here I am. And here is my talk. 23 years without a proper job. It's almost exactly 23 years since I last had a salaried job, or what my mum and dad would have called a proper job. And in that time, I have enjoyed myself enormously doing tech work and getting paid for it without having a salary. So to start with, I, I, I ran my own company. I had this crazy idea about, this was the early days of the internet becoming famous and um, well, widespread. And I had the idea that maybe digital cash would be the next big thing. So I started a digital cash company in 1995. And it didn't quite work out because the world wasn't really ready for it. So after eight years of running my digital cash company, um, I went back to more conventional self-employment. So since, since then, I've been freelancing. I've been self-employed. I'm currently contracted into the Scottish Government to help with some of their infrastructure work. What I want to share with you is some of the lessons that I've learned along the way so that you can avoid making the mistakes that I've made. So this talk is for you if you've ever thought about ditching the day job, about trying to make your working life work for you rather than you working for it. We are amongst the most lucky people in the world because we tech people who do coding for a living, we have the opportunity to frame the way we work to suit us. We can work anywhere, we can work at any time of the day that suits us. Not all jobs let you do that. If you are a bus driver, for example, you have to show up when the bus timetable says so. But we, we can work, as long as we have our laptops and we have an internet connection, we can work from anywhere. What we have to do is to work out how we get a job that lets us do that, how our employer will be happy to have you working remotely. Easiest way i found of making that possible is to work for yourself because then you are your own employer and you can set your own rules. So who am I? That might not look like me, but that was me many years ago when I had the digital cash company into Trader. It's a classic bit of indirect benefit from being female. The reason I'm on the cover of this magazine was not because I was hugely successful, because I wasn't at the time. I was just odd. I was a female doing a tech startup when there weren't many startups around at all, and there were very, very few women. So if you actually looked at this magazine that I'm on the cover of, the actual article is a single column about page 23. But just because I was female, they put me on the cover. Fantastic. Doesn't look much like me. Um, I, I, I took that, that home to my dad and said, oh, what do you think of this? And he went, well, what? I go, this, what, what, that, what do you think of it? Well, what am I looking at? I said, it's me. He couldn't recognize me. I didn't actually look like that then either. They dare brushed out all the freckles. They'd done lots of clever stuff, but it was me. So this talk isn't going to be all about me. 
but I will just quickly tell you who I am. I am a freelancer. I do DevOps. I do full stack. I am next going to be available in the autumn, should that be of interest. Um, I like doing conferences. I enjoy speaking at them, even though I'm terrified by doing it. I'm going to co-host the engineering track on Edinburgh's Turing Festival. So if you are coming to Edinburgh for either EuroPython or for the Turing Festival, come say hello. I'll be there. For some reason I don't quite understand, people keep asking me to do keynotes. So I've done EuroPython, I've done now DjangoCon Europe and um, PyCon Web last, last year. I want to do a shout out for PyCon Web, by the way, because it's only about 200 kilometers down the road from here. Really good conference if you're interested in doing web type of Python and Django stuff. It's good, good conference to go to. Um, and I founded Luzmi, as well as the digital cash company. I have a habit of starting things. I'm, I'm good at starting. Not so good at finishing, really good at starting stuff. Loves me is my side project. It's an ebook search site. And if you like ebooks and you want to buy them cheap, it's really good. But it's not really done as a side project to make money. What it is, is somewhere I can learn all the technical stuff that I need to be able to do when I go and pitch myself to do the paid work. It's a fantastic technical playground where I can play with whatever technology. I feel like looking into at the time. And doing it with a real project as opposed to testing exercises helps me understand the technology much, much better than if I was just going to buy a book and learn the code the easy way. Trying to actually get it new technology to do something real is absolutely a fantastic thing to do with a side project. Don't do it, I mean, you can do it for the money, don't, you don't have to. The money might come because you have had the side project. And in this case, I've been, I've been running this now for, I think it's eight years, and I've made quite a lot of money from it, indirectly. Because I'm doing this, I've got to play with real-time data, which got me into Firebase, which got me to become a Google developer expert. Because I'm interested in real-time data, I started getting into Django channels. I don't know if Andrew Godwin is in the room, but if you are, thank you for Django channels. Yes. So, I think as technical people, we need to explore what we do all the time to play with stuff. It's not just about work, it's about play. Find out what it is that you want to do and learn. Because if you're not learning in this industry, this is one of the, the single biggest things I've learned after working in tech for three decades now. If you're not learning and you're bored at what you do, it's your fault. Because there's so much out there to learn to do that is new. That's where the fun is to me. And working should be fun. But it's not about me. It's about you. Presumably some of you are here because you like the sound of the talk about how do you make money from what you do? Now, the classic idea is you have a, you have a brilliant idea. Say, for example, you, you think it's a digital cash startup might be a great idea. So you leave your job, you raise some money, you hire some staff, you get investors, board of directors, all of that stuff. That is one way of doing it. You may end up being the next Facebook or the next Skyscanner or the next name the company that you, you think you would like to have been an early adopter with or early starter with. But you don't have to make that big jump. And one of the things that I have learned is that it's a really good idea to start smaller. Even if you have the idea that you want to start a big company, you don't have to do that as your first step into the unknown. What you can do is learn how to run a company. Now, in my case, I knew I was always wanted to run a company. So the preparation I did for it, apart from the technical knowledge I was learning, was thinking, well, if I want to run a big company, I better understand accounting. So I took myself off and did a diploma in accounting and finance as an evening class, which was 
fantastically useful when I actually did start the company and I wanted to make sure that the accountants worked for me, not me for them. When they were giving me, um, how can I put it politely, nonsense and telling me what I had to do, and I'd go, no, that's not right because you don't understand that figure. I do. So if you want to do a big company and you want to be the boss, understand what it is that you need to have as well as the technology and the great idea to make that successful. And you can start really small. You don't have to run a big SaaS service. One of the things in the startup world that I circulate around is we, we do this, this idea that you can start with the smallest possible thing. It doesn't have to be a service, it could be a book, it could be a course, it could be a, um, a tiny little ebook that shares knowledge and gets you through the process of learning how to sell to people. Because for most of us, you know, as tech people, we are famous for being introverts. The idea of being somebody that goes and says, I've done this, pay me for it. That's, that's quite a hard thing for us to do. So you have to get used to doing it. You have to get used to practicing those things that are hard so that you can get better at it. So a small thing, like if you do WordPress, for example, a small plugin could be the start of your self-employed career. You don't have to think of it as a long-term investment. If you do something like a book, there is no support cost. If you do something like um, an online, on, online training course, you might choose to offer that support as a part of the, the offering, but you don't have to. But what it does get you to do is something you can do it in your spare time whilst you're still being salaried, but it gets you on the road to being that person that controls their working life. You could do a, you could do a service. Um, the great thing about having a service offering is it's recurring revenue, which is the kind of thing that accountants get very happy about. They like recurring revenue because it means you can forecast what next month's income is likely to be in a way that if you're selling single one-off books, you just don't know. People might buy the book and never talk to you again. But a service, once they've signed up, if you're doing something useful, then they will keep paying you month after month. But the downside is you have to keep showing up month after month after month and doing the support. And quite often what people do is to forget that support costs money. If it's yourself that's running the business, you might say, but that's okay because my time is free. That's the wrong way to look at it. Your time is your most valuable resource. So you really need to think how you're going to spend that time well. And what I suggest to people who, who talk to me about business ideas is even if you are going to do the whole thing yourself, as I tend to do with my project, you can code it, you can support it, you can promote it, you can sell it. Even if you are doing it yourself and you are therefore not charging yourself any money because you are free, cost it as though you were paying somebody to do that. Because if you're going to scale the idea beyond just you, somebody else is going to want to be paid for their time. So you may as well get that in the model from the outset so that you can understand whether it is a prof prof profitable idea or not. You can publish stuff. Now, a lot of people make money from indirect methods. They, they publish v blogs and vlogs, video blogs, um, and then they monetize it through the advertising mechanism. This is something I have not actually done yet, so I can't really talk about it, but I, I have seen people being very successful at it. So there are many ways in which you can make money from 
it, what the accountants call monetization. It doesn't have to be a straightforward sell. I don't have to give you a book and you give me $10. It doesn't have to be that, although that can work very well. Affiliate commission is how I make money at the moment through Lusme. If you buy a book through my site, I've signed up with Amazon, with Kobo, with Apple, so that when I send traffic to them and that they, people buy through that connection, I will get a small percentage of it. And it doesn't cost the person buying the book any more because Apple and Amazon ex take that as a cost of doing business. They, they expect to have to pay something for the traffic that they get. So that can work quite well. It doesn't work so well when your, your, your service is cheap ebooks, which is what my site does. Because when I tell you about a book being on sale for a dollar and you buy it, I get six cents. So fantastic. That's not going to keep me in beer. But it, it, it adds up. But you can also sell advertising. Because what you, you do, if you're serving a particular targeted market, somebody else wants to get to that market. So advertising can be done well, and it can make money. It doesn't have to be the awful experience that we all know when you go to a site and you're just bombarded with buy, buy, buy sites. But a, a, more, a better way, perhaps, of doing that kind of advertising revenue is to go for sponsorship, which is, if you've listened to pod podcasts quite often, they'll have a, a message from our sponsor. So you don't actually have an advertising break as such, but they, 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 the sponsor is paying for the podcast to be produced and they get a mention because of it. So it's kind of like advertising, but it's a bit more um, formal of a relationship. But data analytics, this is where I've made the most money. And it's not by doing anything creepy like Facebook kind of selling on data. But through my website, the, the book site, I've got an awful lot of data about what people are buying and what prices they're buying at. Now, that is really valuable information if you are a book publisher. So I make my six cents when you buy the book through my site. I actually made about £100,000 through selling data about what pe people are doing. That's a much more interesting number to, to be thinking about. So if, if you are doing anything where your project is capable of collecting the data, not the personal data that we are being warned about through GDPR. That doesn't have to be what you're selling. It can be a very honest sale of people are buying more crime at this price than they're buying romance at that price. Or in the US, their expectation is that they will pay $10 for a book, whereas in the UK, it's two pounds. That sort of information is hugely valuable, so do not underestimate it. I'm going to give you a few examples. People always say to me, oh, you can't make money out of writing an e-book. But, yes, you can. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here has tried the Meteor um, real-time data system. It's, it's, it's pretty good. I've moved away from it now. I prefer Django channels and Firebase. But the story here is that two guys, Sasha Grief and Tom Coleman, Coleman, wrote a book about this new technology. Because the documentation that came with the technology was not as good as the actual software was. So, because they wrote a very good book, and it's an absolute classic example of how to write a technical educational book, lots of code examples, lots of GitHub repositories to say this is exactly what you need to do and this is how you do that particular thing. Everybody who wanted to do anything with Meteor bought this book. So when I looked at the stats a couple of years ago, they'd made $300,000 from it over 18 months. I think they've made a lot more since. And this was a self-published book. They didn't have to get a contract 
from a publishing house. They didn't have to pitch it to anybody. They just wrote it and started selling it and started making money. People say, but you can't make money as a solo founder. Well, again, I don't know if you, any of you use Balsamic. It's an absolutely fantastic wireframing tool. That was started as a solo business by Peldy, who is now... When I, when I did this talk a couple of years ago, he was talking about profits of, annual profits of 2 million. I, I checked a couple of days ago, it's now annual profits of 6 million. He's not doing it by himself anymore, there's about 20 people. But still, that's a solo founder started a hugely successful business. People say, oh, but, uh, you can do this in the USA, but you can't do it here. Nonsense. We're seeing so many great companies. Where I live in Edinburgh, in Scotland, we have a very successful company called Skyscanner that was started by three people on a kitchen table to do travel pricing comparison. And it just got sold for, I can't remember, it, two billion quid? A lot of money. Most, quite a lot of people know... Um, Patio 11, he, Patrick McKenzie, he's a great speaker if you ever get a chance to see him. He has made a very successful business out of being the kind of tech person who can talk tech to management and management to tech and above all make money from it and not being afraid to charge. His, his common mantra is charge more. No, more, even more, charge more. If you're doing something that's useful and people want it, they will pay for it. Be happy to accept that what you do is worthwhile. There's always a reason why we go, but yes, Rachel, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're talking great, but I can't do it. No, no, not me. Well, you can, you can. Anybody, if they want to, they can do it. John Morrow is somebody that I have never yet met in, public, in person, but I would love, love to. He has made a successful business out of tech, and he cannot move from the neck down. So if he can do it, I can do it, and you can do it. He runs um, a company about blogging. His particular craft is words. He does fantastically good writing and teaching people how to write good words and make money from it through his blogging site. So you can. You can do it, you can start small. I encourage you to start small, but don't stop there. Think big, but learn your craft. Because in the same way as we have to learn how to code from a starting point, which is hello world, we need, if we're going to work for ourselves, to learn all the extra skills bit by bit, at small steps. And you have to be prepared to fail. You have to be prepared to make an utter ass of yourself and get it wrong. And that's part of the job. Because if you don't fail, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Now, one of the many things that I've learned over the years is I actually like being a beginner at things. My, my hobby is music. My, my hobby is jazz. I am now learning my third jazz instrument because I like that step of going from I don't even know how to hold a bass to Hey, I'm playing music now with other people. Fantastic. You can learn how to learn. And no matter how old you are, you might go, but I'm too old to start. Rubbish. I was 50 when I took up the double bass. By the time I'm 60, I'll probably be on the trumpet. But, you know, you, you can learn anything. You can start. The only thing that stops you is the fear of failure. So learn to get past that by failing. Doing something you know you can't do learn to deal with it. It's, it's, it's exhilarating. So, when it comes to doing tech work, there is a, a common thing which people say. Don't do B2C, which is business to consumer. It's too hard. You work, have to work too hard for the money. People who are spending their own money don't like spending it. Sell to businesses. Businesses expect to pay for things, that's B2B. B2B, they are used to spending money and it's not their money they're spending, so they are much happier to spend it. 
if you are selling to somebody on an expense account, the most important thing you need to know is A, what are you going to deliver them that they will value, that will make their life better, but also, what's their budget? If they've got an ability to sign off without authorization from anybody else at $500, that's where, below that is where you, your, your pitch should be to them. Because then you can take their money and deliver the service they want without having to go through the death by committee stage. And you can choose the customers you want. It's a, it's a common problem we all have when we start out in business. You think, I am so desperate for money. I will do anything for anyone. Just pay me. A sign of maturity as a business person is when you go, no, thank you, but no, I don't want your business. I don't want your money. You are the one customer for me. You would be better served by somebody else. Because when you do that, what you're doing is addressing the customers you want. And as soon as you start being able to describe the customers that you want, this is actually what I have found to, people told me this, and I didn't believe it until I started doing it. When you say, I don't want those customers paying that money, I want the big customers who are going to be prepared to pay me a lot of money for doing very little work. Once, once you start pitching what, what it is that you can do for that kind of customer, you are much more likely to get that kind of customer than when you start out going anything for anybody at any price. You, you have to define what the customers you want. So you need to work out who they are, what they are going to need from you, and how you deliver it to them that makes them delighted. And then you can be prepared to, to charge more because you're giving them something that's valuable the biggest problem that most people have with, with doing that is themselves, because they're going, why should anybody want what I do? The imposter syndrome is huge in everybody who starts a company, and you have to get past it. And the most important thing you can do with any kind of startup that you do as a tech person, you need to start growing the mailing list from the first time you think about the idea, because those people who you can attract to be on your mailing list are going to be your early adopters, your early customers. And you don't have to have the finished product before you start the mailing list. So first thing, start the mailing list. Now, I've got a few other lessons that I have learned. There are four things. This book, this is a great book, by the way. It's a crime book. I love crime fiction. This one is it's set in, in Quebec in Canada. And it's got, it's got a main character who is the chief inspector who's got a really good view about life. And these four things are what he teaches his raw graduate recruits who he gets sent. And, and it is, you, you have to learn to say these things. I don't know. I, now, so I've been working in the industry for 30 years. I say I don't know when people ask me things because I don't know everything. Sometimes people think I ought to, but I don't. That's good. I'm, I'm willing to accept the fact I do not know, but I can find out. I can say, I need help. This isn't working. I need help with this. Because it's okay to ask for help. We all do it all the time. And I, when I start working with, with, with young graduates, they're surprised when I ask them for help. Because they go, aren't you supposed to be mentoring me? And I go, that's not the way it works. In this industry, we all help each other all the time. We always have questions. We always need help. We just have to share it around. Need to say, I was wrong. Now, <laughs> I remember the first time I, ha I said this in a work context, it was my first job. I was 22. I had spent six months working on site for my, 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 the co company I was working for. We'd been doing, porting some horrible Fortran code onto this horrible machine. Six months' work. The last thing I had to do before we could get it signed off and I could go back to working at home, in, back in Nottingham, was to archive it all, to clear up that what I'd done. By mistake, I deleted the whole damn lot. Six months' work, gone. And I'm 200 miles away from home. My boss is there to sign it off and to take me back. And I've just deleted the whole thing. I just go, oh my god, 
what am I going to do? So is he going to fire me before he gets me back to Nottingham, or will he fire me after he's driven me home? <laughs> so I went to my boss and said, Steve, I've done something stupid. I'm really sorry. I, was, I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. But I've just deleted everything. And he just looked at me and went, yeah, that's interesting. What are you going to do about it? So he didn't fire me. He put back in my mind the fact I could do something about it. And after thinking for a few minutes, I went, oh, yeah, we could restore it from the backup, couldn't we? We could restore it from the backup. I could make those two changes again. We're, it's fine. We're good. I'm not fired. Fantastic. I was wrong. It was, I needed to say it, because otherwise I, I wouldn't have been able to be told how to fix it. And I'm sorry. This is something that we do not say enough in the, in the tech industry that I've seen. We should admit when we've made mistakes, and we should say to the people that we've hurt by those mistakes, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, I apologise. And I'm going to add in my take on those, a couple of those things. You can change the meaning of those words by adding the small word, yet. I don't know can be negative. I don't know yet is a much more positive way of looking at it. I can't play bass well, but I, I can't play bass well yet is what I'm working towards. I want to be able to do it. I'm in that, I'm, I'm in that journey. I can't write groovy yet, but I know how to learn. So next week when I'm doing that project, I will be able to. It's a different mindset. You can change what you do and how you approach problems by reframing them. Yet is a great word. So, I have time for questions. But first of all, I want to say thank you. So, how does this work? Do I just point at, ask if there are questions? Right, uh, for everybody who wasn't here yesterday, we have a microphone right in the middle of the seats. So, if you have any questions, just step up there and Rachel can answer them from up here, so everybody can hear them. Thank you. Oh, and I've, actually, before the questions, I have one more thing I want to say, which is to emphasize what Tobias said in the uh, opening things you have to practice doing these kind of things like talking. So use the opportunity to do a lightning talk, even if you've never done it before, especially if you've never done it before. Get up here and do a talk. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yeah, hello. Thank, thank you for the great talk. I walked a comparable path, so, uh, yeah. You have the scars too. Yeah. And uh, my question is, uh, what you said about learning, I agree, but how, what do you think about the pace, so how, how to fit this with the, all the other things you have to do, and especially because the, at least from my point of view, the learning pace in the IT uh, uh, community is uh, always uh, increasing, so you have to learn more and more and more because more technologies evolve, especially in the web environment, so what do you think about that and what's your opinion on that? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so when I started um, 30 years ago, it was very possible to know pretty much everything about everything because there wasn't much going on at the time. We didn't have the internet as a, as a public um, service. We didn't have desktop computers. We had mini computers. Um, it, was a, it was very small and focused. And over the, over the years, as you're saying, that everything has expanded. So it is not now possible to know everything I think what you need to decide is what you want to focus on, what, what your interest is. Now, for me, because I am interested, I'm actually interested in everything, but I know I can't do it, it all. I care about being able to deliver, I, I describe myself as a full stack developer. I want to be able to do everything from the front end through to the back end and the deployment, which means I have to choose a stack 
to be able to do that on. Now, that stack changes all the time. When I started up Luzme, it was initially, it was MySQL on a, Apache on a single computer. Now it is 30 machines using Celery as a message queue with Django behind it and Django channels and React on the front end and whatever. So I've made my choice about the, the, those things. I wanted to learn one of the new JavaScript frameworks, so that's why I chose React. I could have chosen Vue. I could have chosen any of the others around. You have to focus. I think, and then learn how to deliver something with that, that training. It's not enough to read the book. You have to actually build something. So depending on what your interests are, I would say accept that you can't do everything, make some choices, and then build with, with that restricted set of, of, of technology. Um, but the important thing is to choose to do anything, and then you can always choose to do something different. But if you choose to do nothing and not learn, then you're restricting your, your horizons so, so greatly that, um, that the, there's a problem. Hi. Continuing on that thought, um, yes, you've got to do something. But doing something, there's an opportunity cost in all the other things that you couldn't do. I might, you might have a million ideas of the book you could write, the course you could write, whatever. You have to pick one. How do you pick that one when you've got, the, got this audience and you don't know what it is an audience is actually going to be interested in? What's, how, any suggestions for how to narrow down what's, what's worth focusing on? So, so yeah, again, great question. Um, the, the way which people I respect would answer that question, um, I don't have a good answer myself, so I shall channel other people's, um, is the first thing is to get the audience, to get the mailing list so that you have an, a way of finding out what people are crying out for. For example, in the Python world, the thing that you hear people complaining about having pain and problems with is packaging. Because there are so many different ways to do it. A new way comes along every week. Um, people have a common problem there. You might choose to build a course or a book on that single pain point. Um, what I'm trying to do at the moment, I, I, I suffer from the problem that I have too many ideas, not, in, not few. And so for me, it's trying to niche it down. I am trying to find a problem that people have with spreadsheets. This is my new idea. I think spreadsheets are a scourge of the world. They cause lots of problems. People have problems with spreadsheets. So I need to get, get myself an audience of people who have problems with spreadsheets, and then I listen to them and find out w one thing that they have in common that they complain about and fix it for them. So that will be my next project, is fixing a spreadsheet problem. Um, I don't know what the problem will be yet. I can think of a list of things that might be, but I have to get the audience. It's not a question of tele te telepathically going, oh, I believe that they will want this. You don't know that. You don't have to even think about it. What you have to do is listen to the people who is the audience you want to serve. They'll tell you what they want. And if you can find a small thing that you can deliver to them that makes their life better, you can build from it. Um, so that, that's, that would be my answer, channeling other people, which is don't try to make it up yourself. Find the audience first and listen to them because they will be howling in pain if there's a real problem that they've got that you can help with. You uh, said that in general it's better to have like businesses as your customers, right? Um, how would you suggest, especially if you're just starting out, to find these people or these businesses and to convince them that you're serious, <laughs> that you're not just... Uh... So the th first thing is try, because you, you can... When I had my digital cash company, I was phoning up people in the banks. Now, I was 30 at the time, I think. I didn't know anything. I didn't look like I knew anything. And I was female. I mean, God, women don't do tech. The, I found it amazingly simple, actually, to, to get to the person I wanted to talk to, even if they were like the v, vice president of, of digitalization or whatever. Glorious job title. Because I was, was able to just pick up the phone and go, I would like to talk to the person in charge of this. Could you put me through? They, they actually did to my amazement. And then I had a meeting, and then I tried to sell them stuff. The, 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 
thing you have to do is A, believe that you can do it and, f and find out from rejection that you can't. Don't assume that you can't. But have a very clear uh, what it is you're trying to sell to them or, or what is the problem that they have that you can help with. Because if they have got a problem and you can help and you, you can either save them time or make them money, they will listen to you. So I don't know for an individual person how you would address it, but I do know that just giving it a go is a good way to start. So give it a go. Don't, yeah, and, and just don't waste their time. That's the thing. Once you get in, if your foot in the door, be very clear, say, I've got five minutes with you. I want to, to, to persuade you that this is something I can help with. Am I right? They may go, no. They okay, go, fine. They may go, fantastic, we've been waiting for somebody to tell us this. They don't care. Once you're actually in business, it, as, a, as an employee, people do care about you know, things like experience and job titles and, and past record. In business, they don't. All they care about is they have this problem. Can you help? That's all they care about. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk. One question, if it's possible. Yes. Uh, maybe some kind of similar question to the, uh, as the one before. Um, you had some two statements which are very important to me also. Uh, the one, I need help and uh, I don't know. And, uh, but what's, I mean, if you say something like that, you need to address the, also the right people. Uh, what's your advice on uh, finding the right uh, mentors or advisors, you know? Um, I guess it depends on what context are you talking about? Uh, it, like, is it technical or is it business or...? Yeah, it could, 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 could be both. Uh, so, for example, you might be a great advisor for if you want to uh, get something running, if you want to build up a startup, you have the uh, experience and knowledge. I could ask you almost everything. Uh, how do I start? What's, what do I need? What do I know? Uh, you know, uh, what's, do you know some kind of approach uh, or, or how do you approach the right people or find the right people? Um, that's a very good question. Um, oh, so in the specific um, context about the startup stuff, just following on what you just said, if anybody does want to come and talk to me about that kind of thing, I'm here till Friday, come and talk. Um, if I was going to look for somebody in Say, for example, when I was taking my startup to the next level and I needed to find people who could help me with um, finding investors or a, a, a director that was going to help with a particular problem, I would spend a bit of time framing the problem and focusing on what it was I actually wanted because I would have wanted a partic particular person for a particular problem and the closer I could define it, the better chance I would have then getting that. And then, I would, having, having done that description to myself, I would just ask people I knew. So networking is, is hugely important, which is why this kind of conference is great, because you get to meet people. Um, in terms of, like, for the, for the business side, we in Edinburgh have a very good ecosystem of meetups that, and, and um, investors, bankers, who, who, there's a kind of like a little industry going on. So what, all you need to do is find somebody who knows somebody in it, and then they can recommend somebody else down the, down the line. And the, the important thing is to recognize where you get to meet one of those people, and then not waste their time. This is, this is, a, this is a, a thing which I, I feel people do a lot. They waste time. Time is our most valuable resource. We should not waste it, and we definitely should not waste other people's if they're giving it if they're sharing stuff with us. So if you can focus what you actually want, find somebody that's near. If you don't know anybody that has exactly what you're, lo you're looking for, find somebody that's near it, and then ask them to, to who they would advise about getting to the next stage. And it might be that you go through three or four hoops and jumps to get to the person you actually want, but you start with the person that you know and ask them to get you closer. That works well for me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rachel, for the great talk. Um, you talked a lot about uh, product-based businesses. So, so how would you say uh, does freelancing, contracting, like directly working for people, fit into into that? So I.
do two types of freelancing. Um, one I'm doing at the moment is the straightforward contracting where I do five days a week in somebody else's office. And uh, this is a bit of a novelty for me. It's been many years since I've done this. Uh, it fits into my plan because it's basically making me money so that I can invest in my next idea. Uh, for the other kind of freelancing that I have done, which fits better with the building a business idea, is you're not selling just straightforward time for hours, that time for money. What you're selling is a solution to a problem that, that you can build in whatever hours you like. Um, that, that kind of freelancing works better for, the, for the build, building a business. Um, but then you don't tend, I, I haven't found that it's, it ends up being a business in its own right. So you have to then decide how do you use your time to focus on this business or that, that one. Um, it, it's basically, uh, you make it up as you go along. You know, it's what I'm doing. Uh, there is no single answer, there is no right way. It's whatever works for you. I know, I know people that have started in doing the, the five day a week contracting that's then turned into the project based stuff because they've developed the trust with the customer that they can deliver. Um, other people choose to just do six months on, six months off. Six months doing m money earning, six months doing their own projects. Um, I don't have an answer. It's make it up as you go along. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.